All right, so we're going to get started. Before we go ahead and do the thing that we're about to do, uh, I'm going to explain a couple of things about Zoom for everybody here. Um, so first off, you guys at home, aside from being awesome from being here, um, we can't see you. So I have no ability to turn your camera on or your microphone without your knowledge. I'd have to upgrade you to a panelist. And I think our Zoom account is pretty much locked at this point. So don't worry about that. If you're in your pajamas or less, we won't know. Um, as far as the panelists and I, we do have the ability to look at chat. But Sorry, Vince, you want to stop screen share so we can all see you? Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> you want to see me? Absolutely. Um, so there we go. <laughs> sweet. So the panelists and I won't be monitoring chat. Um, so if you want to get a question, which we, we encourage you to ask questions, use the little Q&A button that's right at the bottom of the screen, right about there. Um, you're going to be able to do that. You can submit questions. And then everybody else, including you know, the rest of you who are here, you guys can upvote questions. So we're going to be mining, looking for sort of the most popular questions um, and fielding those first. So definitely use the Q&A section. That is money for something like this. Um, we will do our best to answer as many of the questions as possible, especially the good ones. If you ask about my hair, we probably won't answer it, but I'll take that offline with you. That's totally fine. Um, so before we go with introductions, I'm going to put Rich Baum on the spot and ask him to give us all a warm welcome and tell us a little bit about why we're all here tonight, Rich. Um, Rich, you're muted. There you go. Got to be smarter than the mute. Okay. Hey, can everybody hear me? Thumbs up. Good. Okay. I don't even know where to begin. Um, all I can say is um, a week ago Sunday, uh, a week ago, two days ago, um, I thought I want to do something. I didn't know what. I wanted to do something. I then reached out to somebody, and then I reached out to somebody else, and then all of a sudden I had a uh, what do we got 12 people here? Um, I am floored that everybody said, yes, we want to help because we want to do something also. It morphed into one thing and then another thing, and it turned out to be this Q&A with what a, I mean, I'm looking at a, a wall full of people, very talented people that we all, most of us know all these people, but I just want to say thank you so much for doing this, for coming. Thank you all panelists. Thank you all. We have um, how many people we got? 186 people on. I can't believe it. We've raised right now almost $2,000, right? $3,000? $2,000? So, actually, Rich, the current number is $3,414. I got to tell awesome. you guys, that's, that's this amazing. Is for, this amazing. is for first responders. Trust me, I'm not going to go to, I can't go to Hawaii anyway with the money, so I'm going to donate it. And uh, all I can say is thank you so much. And we have some really exciting things to do tonight and uh, just have your questions come on out with them and and we just I, we all want to thank you all for for taking the time and finding this uh worth your time so thank you so much for sure rich thank you for putting it together this is going to be a fun night we're going to have uh i mean we've got the lineup is crazy right so you know just to run through introductions to sort of uh talk about who's here we've got rich baum and brian berkowitz Everybody here who's subscribed to Shooting Spaces knows these guys. And if you're not, subscribe after this. We've got Matt Stallone, who has the best setup of everybody here. Uh, Matt, why oh, don't I you say that. hi so they I, can I see I like you. yours better, Vince. Hey, guys, welcome. Thank you all. Rich, thank you so much for putting this on. And for all of you that are signed in, uh, hopefully you get some great information out of this. And, uh, yeah, let's have fun. Absolutely, absolutely. We've also got Tacey Jungman. Tacey, say Youngman. hi. Youngman. Hi, Tacey Youngman. Um, thanks so much, everybody, for coming. And please pepper us with questions. So, and donate as you are able. For sure, for sure. We've also got Gary Gomez. Gary, say hi. Hey, everybody. Happy to be here. Thank you all so much for coming out. Awesome. And we have Mr. Tony Colangelo. I don't know why I keep on doing that to you, Tony. I keep on saying Mr. Tony Colangelo. <laughs> because you're am, money. I, am I the oldest one here? I think I am. So maybe that's it. I don't know. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you again. A heartfelt thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, please contribute. It's a, just a tremendous cause. Thank you again. Awesome. We've also got Wayne Capilli. Wayne, say hi. Hello. 
thank you very much for participating and thank you for letting it, giving me a reason to get out of my pajamas. Oh. <laughs> oh, you're out of your pajamas? I got that from waist down. <laughs> yeah, waist down, yeah. <laughs> and we also have Sam Chen's cat. I'm hoping Sam Chen's cat can say hello. Meow, meow. Oh my God, he's freaking out. Whoa. Hi everyone, I'm, I'm the human being behind the black cat. So um, thanks for being here and we hope we can uh, help make this night a better one. For sure, I, th I think I, it's already off to a good start. We also have PFRE's Brandon Cooper. Brandon, why don't you say hi? Hey everybody, thanks for being here. A man of few words. <laughs> we, we'll get a couple more drinks in him. Gary Castle who is on mute, but I didn't tell him that. So we're going to give him a second there we to go. distract you all. I thought it was a, I was trying to push the space bar. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Hey everybody, that gets me too. thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks, Rich, for getting us all together. Super cool cause and a um, really quick turnaround. I'm super surprised how all of us were able to get together so fast and get something together. Um, I look forward to it. For sure. We've also got D Zunker. D. Yes. Say Hello. Hi. Hello from Houston. Uh, glad to be here. Glad that we're all together and going to be able to talk about things and share share what we know and hopefully uh, um, maybe we can do this again too if we have a lot of fun. <laughs> so. For sure. And if it's horrible, we'll just never speak again. None of us ever, <laughs> forever. And we've also sort of man behind the scenes for a lot of this that's been uh, putting together the tech end of things. We should welcome Brian Berkowitz. Brian. Hey Show everyone! Thanks. thanks for coming to uh, to get to, to this. Uh, what do we have? Three hundred fifty people, which is insane for uh, three hundred fifty people register, which is insane for just a week. So, um, thank you, Rich, for getting this all together and being on my back to get this uh, get this all going in in a week. We're in a hurry, guys. We're uh, we want to get this money out, man. This is the week. Next week, this week, and next week, at least in California, we're peaking, man. It's uh, it's going to be some something else, and there you're in New York, and you're leveled out. But uh, man, we've got to do something about this thing. So anyway, enough of the serious talk. Yeah, yeah. yeah let's let's get unserious. Um, before we really start with questions, just quick show of hands or audible, right? Who here is still shooting in some way, shape, or form? Are you guys still shooting? Not okay. Much. So Matt Stallone, Gary Gomez, Sam. I don't know if I saw your hand or not. Limited. Jordan D. So it, I can't see everyone all at once, but is everyone still kind of shooting? No, nope. I'm shooting. Sure, yes. yes. Okay. Who gave a nope? That's me, Tony. Okay. All right. So you, you've decided to step back a little bit, right? Is that what it comes down to? <laughs> no, all my shoots were canceled. <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah, I think that's the follow-up question, right? Like who here is still shooting? And then secondary to that, how much, how much volume, how much has your volume taken a hit in the immediate? 100%. We'll start with Matt. Matt, how's it going uh, by you? We, good, good, thanks. Um, I mean, we're not as a hard hit as I think down what's happening in the States. So fortunately for us, we're, we're, we're numbers are creeping up. But anyways, uh, we're probably 80% down. We're still doing, you know, maybe three or four shoots a week really right now, which is not much. Usually we're doing that in a day. So I understand a lot of homeowners don't want people to come in and I get it, but we're still trying to service our clients uh, as best we can. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's definitely, it's definitely going to be a balance, right? Because you've got the homeowners to think about. You've got yourself to think about, um, you know, it's not just about not getting sick. It's also about not contracting being the carrier and bringing it to other places. So I bet a lot of people are constantly thinking about that and then whatever family you have. Um, yeah. before the rest of you guys tell me a little bit more about the, the scenario out there, I should probably mention that, um, what was not announced is we've all kind of upped the ante in terms of driving donations. So guys, this is, this is a fundraiser, right? We're not charging for this obviously, but we are asking for donations for our GoFundMe. The URL is, will be up on the screen again in a little while. Um, Currently, we've got a lot of great people kicking in. Super thankful for that. I should say that there's also going to be, at the end of this, uh, several giveaways. So we are raffling off to only folks who donate several items. I'm going to run through them right now. First is the Run and Gun Workflow by Gary Castle. 
Then you've got, woo, right? Yeah, I feel like I, feel like I need a, a clap track or something. I've got to tee that up. Then we've got the Shooting Spaces entire webinar collection as well. The Art of Real Estate Cinematography with Jordan Powers and Nick S. I'm not trying that. Can you say that for me, Jordan? Schwartz and Juber. Okay. I've, I've read it like a hundred times in my life, but yeah, I'm never going to try that. The Art and Science of Great Composition, Tony Colangelo. Mastering Real Estate Photography with Gary Gomez. And then we've got two one-year subscriptions to ProEDU. So at the end of this, guys, at the end of this show tonight, we are going to use a random number generator and a giant Excel file. Jordan's going to do some nerdy shit, and we're going to figure out who's getting what. So keep that in mind, and hopefully that compels a couple more people to kick in. We're going to only bring this up four or 70 more times throughout the night. So back to the, uh, back to the, the sort of question at hand, right? Like, uh, Matt, you had said your you know, volume is down by 80%. That's not too far from what, what I'm seeing across the country. Um, yeah. But Brandon and Tony, you guys are up there in Canada and you guys are fairly remote. What are you guys, what are you guys seeing in terms of volume? I'm a little more remote than Tony probably. And also I do high volume real estate. So <clears throat> I've noticed quite a slowdown. Um, but what's happened, like we had about a week and a half of things kind of just dying off. But now it's just shifting. So I'm getting a lot of requests for eye guides, 3D stuff. We're also getting some requests. We're trying to pivot a little bit to, you know, provide some good options for like walk, like quick, cheap walkthrough videos just to give people a chance to see a, a good uh, a good look at the home without having to actually go over there or ask the sellers to leave. So I don't really know what to expect because right now our cases are very low. I don't know. I mean, we've been low for two and a half weeks now. We're not seeing a big spike. If it stays that way, I may remain busy. If it changes, then then we might see it completely get shut down. Our province seems to be pretty aggressive. Even though we don't have a lot of cases, they're really kind of trying to get ahead of it. So it's kind of day-to-day for me right now. You know, we're, we're kicking your ass in cases in New York. Yeah. We have so many yeah. cases, it's ridiculous. But that's not something I want to think about or dwell on or think about opening my window for that matter. Uh, D, talk to me about volume. What's going on by you? You're on mute currently. You're still on mute. So while we're waiting for D, Tacey, how's your volume? I'm back. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> oh, D. No, all day was not working for me. So anyway, so I, before our rodeo here in Houston got shut down March 11th, I was booked through the third week in April. So I was super busy. Everything was canceled or postponed, um, but I've been gradually getting additional calls and resources, a lot of drone work, a lot of uh, things related to architecture. And I do mostly commercials, so, um, so that's, it's a little different than the, than the real estate. I haven't, I haven't done any real estate. It's all been the, on the commercial side, so I'm not completely not doing anything, but uh, I'm sleeping late in the morning, so I'll put it that way. So. Okay. Okay. So, and Tacey? Yeah, so for me, um, I'm down about 90% for this month. And, um, you know, we're sort of at the ground zero in Washington State. And out of all of the counties in Washington State, my specific county has the highest per capita rate of anywhere in the state. So with that, I made a decision that I'm only shooting vacant homes. And I have been asked to shoot owner occupied homes. And it's been incredibly difficult to say no, but that's what I'm doing. So, sure, sure. Yeah, no, that's uh, that is something I'm hearing from a lot of a lot of people. A lot of my folks are doing the same, taking that same approach. Wayne, talk to me about we, volume by you. Real estate photography is down ninety nine percent, but ninety nine percent. Well, I'm I'm actually a good guy, and I'm I'm actually staying. I'm not going. I'm actually only going from my house to my studio. And um, I, I actually don't go out and shoot. Well, there are there are photographers in my area that are shooting that I don't think they really should or not, but we're in that kind of gray area. So a couple of weeks ago, I started switching over to doing more commercial work. So I'm doing architectural models and some of my commercial clients are actually sending me product um, directly from factory. So I'll, I'll switch over to commercial work until real estate starts coming up again. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. And Sam Chen, talk to me. What's going on by you? 
Oh, and know, actually, his, what, where are you specifically? I'm in San Diego. Okay. So historically, March and April have always been my busiest months. And I was busier than ever the first half of uh, March. But then all of a sudden with this pandemic, um, everything shut down. So I stopped shooting. But recently, <laughs> um, our governor has reclassified real estate as essential. So all of a sudden, my phone started to ring again. So um, it's kind of a gray area, like Wayne said. And I you know, only take things that are like aerial or exterior only, you know, so it's case by case, but it's kind of difficult. And I think that's what we're all frustrated with is there's no kind of black and white, hard and fast rule that's universal across the country. Yeah, no, that, that again, makes a lot of sense. And I think uh, what we'll learn throughout the night and what I'm seeing on the boards is it's a really uh, very specifically personal decision, right? On what people are taking on. Tacy, you know, the uh, sort of way you're operating sounds really familiar to me. It's the way a lot of my folks are operating. And Wayne, you know, the, the steps and measures you're taking, I can totally understand that too. I'm in New York City, right? I, if I was shooting, I would be probably doing what you're doing. Um, well, now that we've had a couple of minutes, we've definitely logged in some great questions. So I'm going to go ahead and start with the Q&A. Marty Lang asks, how many of you are adding or have added 3D tours as a service you provide to your clients in the COVID era, if you haven't already been specifically? So out of uh, who here is doing 3D tours now and were you doing it or were you doing much of it before? I've yeah, never done we were it doing it before. Sorry, we, we were doing it before. It's just now every tour that they order, they want the 3D tour. So it's not new to us, obviously, but it's new to everyone who now wants to include it for their clients. Yeah, I want to jump in and say that um, I'm pretty active in the group, as everybody knows. I've done one video on my YouTube for the uh, new Rico camera. Um, I am blown away. Uh, Tacey, you probably have noticed, too, how many people are buying this camera and jumping on to 3D. And one thing I'm also finding out is everybody's got to understand when you get into 3D, there's a lot more you got to learn. It's not just getting the camera. It's, it's actually kind of a technical thing, learning how, how it works and how it does. So I'm just going to be doing several videos coming up and trying to help people with uh, try to better understand 360. So I just want to say I know that a lot of you out there are getting it and, and starting to add it, especially now. But uh, do it with a grain of salt and... and do your research and uh, really try to understand what 360s are. So. One other thing on 360 for me is that um, my two cents about this is that once we come out from the cloud of underneath of this, everybody's going to be expecting 360. Nobody's going to want to pay a lot for, for basic 360. And so one of the things that I'm trying to do is to create a higher end product so that when the clouds rise, people have a choice between a basic and a more premium version. So however you're approaching 360, I'd encourage you to think forward to what are people going to want down the road. Can you give sure. us examples, you know, Tacey? Sorry, of what, what's a yeah, premium it. versus a basic? Um, well, there's lots of different tour providers out there, and I'm mm. not going to name names. So the one that I'm using enables me to integrate stills, video, info spots, all kinds of things. And um, what I'm doing is I'm putting that together and then at including a basic Zillow video or Zillow 3D as well. Um, because I think there are going to be agents who want to pay for that down the road. So that's one of the things I'm preparing now. But do you think 3D is here to stay, uh, Tacey, after we get out of this thing? I think it's going to stay for a while. I think, you know, even if we wave a magic wand in the next two weeks, I think there's going to be a lag of fear from some people of having people in their homes. And I think there's also going to be a split in the market between some agents who say, you know, no, I don't want any of that 360 virtual stuff. I just want a few images to sell the home. And then there are going to be others who completely embrace it. And we start to see fewer showings. Um, but more qualified buyers. So, right. can I jump in there? Yeah, please do. <clears throat> um, Tacy, we we do that. My my company does that. We have a lower end and a higher end 360 available. Um, and we use Matterport and we use the Zillow 3D. Um, the we also use we have my whole team has the Rico 
thetas or whatever. But we just recently got some Z1s, and those are crazy different uh, quality for, for resolution. Um, I've noticed in the Matterports especially, it looks 100 times better. Um, and I think that what it's going to do this whole time is it's going to expose the realtors that aren't used to using 3D to how beneficial it is because they're be able to get rid of like looky loo type of buyers. They're going to be able to like show a house without spending time on it and get people more involved or like more, more like they're going to have a better sense of what the house is like before they even go see it. And which is going to either they're going to walk through it on 3d and not like it, or they're going to like it and want to go see it in person. Right. So it kind of weeds out a lot of the, the people that aren't even interested in, which is going to save a lot of time. And that's what is huge for my realtors is their time. And then um, we're, we're considering, I mean, we have bundles that it, it's included. Like we have video photos and 3d as a, as a package because it has the whole spectrum of marketing and uh, we sell them like hotcakes. It's, it's crazy. So Gary, before I read off some of the comments, I just need to address something. You look like a pretty young guy in your thirties. Did you say looky Lou? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that's awesome. That's what, you know, it's so, like from the, like when you're on the freeway and there's like people driving, getting in accidents and all the looky Lou drivers. Here's my dad. I don't know. <laughs> hey, no, you know what? It's, it's swell. I'll say that. Um, so. so let me, uh, let me jump in, Vince. I yeah, please, mention, please. I, I've been doing 360s since uh, I was Google trusted photographer since 2014. And I've kind of seen the 360s come and go. Um, it, it's literally hot. It's really not. One of the things that 360s have struggled with is actually having a platform to show them. It's kind of like video before YouTube. We could do a video, but there was no place to put it and show it and display it. And those are things that are actually starting to happen that are going to make the 360s um, more viable. And people are learning about them in this whole process. So I think that those things together, plus the one-click cameras, before the one-click cameras, you did it with the DSLR and, and you, you get great oh, quality God. that way, but there is a bit of a labor of love to go through that process. Um, I, I'm still, I, I am still 100% DSLR. That's what I do for my commercial work. But um, the Theta, Theta Z1 is, is good. The one-click cameras are good for the, the real estate, but um, we're, we're getting a lot of information about 360s. So the customer is getting educated and then we've got platforms that we can actually publish them that we haven't had in the past. We're still not to the point to where the video is with YouTube and that you just throw it up there and you're done. Um, but um, I get, I think we're getting closer to that. So I think this whole next wave of 360 is just going to continue to build on itself. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask a question to the group. Uh, is anyone here delineating between 360 and 3D? Because well, from, from where I stand, they're the not the same technology. What's that? Let me look up the word uh, delineating really quick so I can answer <laughs> so, your question. So I, I, we're, we're using it interchangeably in this conversation. Right. And it's and, actually different. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very different in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, who here is not seeing any value in that differentiation? I don't. The 60s Go and 50s it. here, it's the, it's the same thing. I mean, it's kind of like I, I started with Matterports back in like 2017 or 16 or when they first came out. And I always understood that that was 3D. So, but what Zillow does is more of a 360 because you're, you can't like, I don't know, you can just see the whole room at once, but it's almost the same thing to me. Well, the, the difference really, it comes down to you're doing an infrared scan or a laser scan with 3D. So you're getting that spatial information like the eye guide and the Matterports do. Um, and so that information is important for being able to do just figure out the space and put together a floor plan, you can add that. The 360s, just the photos. Um, and a lot of times that's all people really need. Um, you don't need those two pieces integrated. Um, and so there is a difference, but I'm not sure the customers are educated enough to understand the difference. Well, sure, they using they're both not sure that they even see the difference. And I think they're using both 3D and 360 as an interchangeable description of what they want anyway. Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, um, it's funny as a photographer, 3D, 360s. I mean, my company bought circle picks to get rid of 360s in a lot of the markets, right? Like that was 
that was very much part of the strategy. Um, because from a photographic standpoint, you've got no control. You can't create much of a composition, right? Um, and we sort of looked at it, looked down on it as this thing, right? This thing that was kind of unwieldy and wasn't really creating a compelling image. However, with COVID, went and changed what's important, right? Now there's a lot of importance in not getting people into the space, right? So looking at this panel, looking at this group here, you know, I sort of look to the, the older school photography purists, right? And I would ask them, you know, and I'm looking at you, Tony, I'm looking at Gary, I'm looking at Rich, I'm looking at Jordan. Like, do you guys see 3D being adopted into your business? And then we'll talk about the longer term questions that I think uh, I'm seeing coming up. So um, I'll chime in. I, I didn't actually ever offer any kind of 360 or 3D prior to this. I actually did, like Rich, I did the Every Escape years ago uh, the, the for Yellow Pages or whatever. But um, I haven't, I never offered 360 at all. And then it just so happened at the end of the last year, this this company asked me if I could do 360 photos for them. So I picked up a, a Rico Z1 and I did them all and I, the job paid for itself. And then, um, you know, I, I got more excited just about playing with the new toy uh, just cause I was, you know, I, I actually have been kind of transitioning all of my real estate business to my other photographer as I focus more on architecture and interiors. So I, I was kind of like on my way out and then I got this new toy and I was, you know, trying to experiment with it, see how I get the best quality out of it. And then all this happened. And now I'm like, well, I'm getting kind of sucked back into real estate uh, involuntarily, but I'm, I'm fine with it because I'm trying to really push this 360 thing. I'm in a smaller town in Minnesota. There's only like, there's less than a hundred thousand people here. And um, you know, there's probably, there's less than 300 active realtors here. So there's not a lot of business, but I, I stay very busy. And no, nobody was ever interested in doing any kind of 360. And um, I am trying to look ahead. I mean, it, you can just look at Amazon. Like the Z1s are sold out. You, I don't think you can get one right now. Um, it's it's just a, a the market's gonna is telling us that this is definitely the way things are gonna go. So I'm just trying to get ahead of it. Um, once things come back in stock, I may even pick up another one. And um, I was talking with another photographer in the community and. <laughs> he came up with the idea of actually renting the 360 camera out. So I'm also doing that. I'm going to rent out my 360, my, my theta, the Ryko or whatever to um, agents. Um, it, so they can just, they can do the shooting and then they can just send me the files and I'll edit it for them. Um, so I'll probably pick up a couple more of those cameras when they, um, when they come in and then I don't even have to go shoot at all. I'll just edit the 360s and um, post them up there. But again, I'm kind of getting sucked back into the real estate thing. Uh, but it's from a completely different angle. So it's, it's really interesting. But it's not a bad thing that you're coming back to real estate. No, 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 not at all. I'm just saying it, my, 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 I, I don't have an issue with real estate. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I was just, my, my, my career aspirations were starting to change. And since those have been kind of put on hold for the time being, I'm taking all the, the real estate that's coming in now. Uh, whereas I, I wasn't before I was kind of giving it, giving it away. So it's just, it, I just, I just see at least real estate photography business changing uh, towards more focus on this and you know, we'll see what happens. It's, it's interesting. So that actually kind of leads to one of the next questions from the audience, which is, you know, let's say aside from 360s slash 3Ds becoming more popular, what are your thoughts about the future of real estate photography all, after all of this? And I'll frame that up, right? Um, this this crisis is not going to be over in 10 more days. Um, you know, and frankly, people will adopt new habits. Um, do I think we all turn into Howie Mandel and we're not going to shake hands when we see each other? No, but you know, what are the, what are the effects of this long term? right? Is it that you see uh, the bottom sort of uh, tier of agents dropping off and only more serious agents last? Is it that you think there's a greater focus on higher end or more products or lower end video? Where, where do you guys think this goes? If you had to kind of uh, take a guess, right? Pull a Nostradamus and tell us, where do you think, what do you think your business looks like three years from now? Well, first and foremost, I'll just start really quick. Sorry, just because I, I was leading this way anyway, but I, I do think that what's going to end up happening is um, people are going to get used to not having to go look at homes physically. 
And I, I think that's going to be a huge trend uh, once this is all through. So um, aside from 360, I'm also going to be I'm pushing video a lot more, obviously. Um, I, I have been for the last couple of years, but video, I, I just think photos are kind of just the default. But I, I, again, I think the trend is going to be towards staying at home and seeing more homes. Um, in, in a less in less amount of times without having to actually go for them. So I, I just think that's going to be what, what ends up happening with this industry. Gary Gomez, what do you think? Where do you think this goes? Uh, well, I don't shoot real estate full time, so I might not be as in touch as some of the other folks here. But a um, couple things stand out to me. I, I'm sure there will be lasting effects from the current situation. I don't know what they will be. I, um, I'm not sure if we could credit COVID for creating a scenario where people stop going in person to look at houses. Um, and my logic trail there is only because not everybody is currently looking to buy a home. It's just the current home buyers. But maybe if, if the trend shifts because the realtors are demanding a different product from the photographers, then that could certainly be a possibility. I don't know. It's hard to say. It's, it's just speculation for me. Um, what I do see currently this could totally change probably in the near future things develop quickly but um i think the quality of the 360 tours that, that i've seen so far doesn't hold up to photography with a modern camera um, i think you get a lot more detail and going back to something that i think vince said just a few minutes ago um is perfectly in line with my view on it it's um you know, I've got like a private Facebook group and we were talking about 360 tours there very recently because I just bought um, I just bought a 360 camera myself and I was asking a bunch of questions about it. Um, I kind of view it as like the anti-camera. Uh, there is no composition. It's you see everything. You plop the thing in the middle of the room and my six year old could probably do almost as good of a job as I can with it with five minutes of instruction. Um, and I don't know, it's, it's hard to say, it's hard to say right now where that will go in the future, but I do think it's got a long way to go before it replaces photographs because as photographers, if we do our best job, um, particularly with the composition, I think there's a much more compelling story to be told about a property. And the other part of this, I've actually had this conversation with some of my clients who are real estate agents, sometimes uh, shooting too many photos and showing too many things gives people reasons not to go see a property. So just from the purest sales perspective of there's a property that needs to move, there's inventory that needs to move, and there are consumers that need to see it and then buy it. If you sort of give away too much information, you might push away potential buyers that would otherwise see a little bit of charm in the flesh, so to speak. Um, and you know, like we're in an Amazon Prime culture. I just don't necessarily see the emotional tie and frankly, the size of the investment for a home buyer being replaced by convenience on the internet. Um, but like I said a minute ago, there's a long way to go here with the technology and it might just get there. And maybe everything I'm saying is for no reason, but Right now, I think it's a long way off. So I have a hard time wrapping my head around it. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree with you. I don't think it ever replaces photography. Mm -hmm. I think at least for the foreseeable future, it's adding to or in addition to photography. Matt Stallone, what do you think, what do you think your business looks like three years from now? Um, well, here's my two cents. First, we have to look at the real estate agent and what they want to spend. And as all of us know, a lot of them don't want to spend a lot of money. So I think any excuse that they're going to have to lessen the services is going to be the one factor right off the bat. Um, I think photos are still going to be the way that they're going to go. I don't think, again, we've had iGuide and we've had Matterport and we've had all these other systems for what the last five years. Um, and now that with this pandemic, it's kind of come more to light, but you know, what we're starting to do now is we're adding detailed photos of stuff like the furnace room or the garage or the basement that isn't finished. Agents don't really care. They just want as much information as possible right now. It doesn't necessarily have to be in a 360. I think it's going to be the same. I don't think it's going to really 
honestly grow that much. Um, I just think everyone's in fear right now. So they're, they're using it and they're making their clients happy, but once it's gone, they'll, they'll probably remove that service and save some money. Yeah. I think one thing that is going to happen though, is that, um, and maybe those of you who lived through 2008, 2009 and business can shed more light on this, but, um, all of those agents who've joined the market in the last five years are suddenly going to have to learn how to actually sell houses and do things that differentiate themselves. Um, and I think that it, it's going to become a lot about branding and having product that allows them to really stand out, whatever that piece may be for their brand. But there's going to be a lot of agents who just don't know how to do that and don't have the funds and resources to, to commit. So. I want to hear from Sam Chen. Sam yeah. Chen. Yes. Yes. What do you think? What, what, what do you think, Sam? Three years. Thanks for, thanks what does your cat think? Yeah. <laughs> Come What's here. Your, Come what here, your cat think? Come here, Kitty. Um, you know, I always believe that, uh, you know, that old saying of trial by fire and being tempered by fire and heat and crisis and, disasters, I think that's going to really separate the, you know, the men from the boys, so to speak, or the women from the girls, if I can uh, please, Tacey, I know Tacey's rolling her eyes, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, just like to go on what um, I think it was Matthew that was saying is that it's not just the agents, but it's also the photographers. It's going to separate the men from the boys in uh, real estate photography. When this thing is lifted, who are the men who are going to step up and problem solve, you know, kind of like, you know, agents have to all of a sudden learn how to sell a home. Well, all the photographers will be tested and how can we problem solve and whether it's being, you know, a one-stop shop providing all the solutions. If we can provide solutions, can we hire a friend or a contractor to just so that it's transparent and um, that, the agent, all they see is, oh, my problem just got solved. I'll stick with this guy. So I think our loyalty is being tested more than ever right now. And one of the things that I think we can work on proactively while we're waiting is sort of nurturing that connection and that relation that we have right now with our agents and with our clients. I mean, how I'm, the other day I got a, a random text from one of my favorite clients. I've only been shooting for her for less than a year. And she's like, how are you? Are you okay? I mean, I was like, oh my God, I, I don't even get this from my own family. <laughs> and I'm getting this from, <laughs> from this client. And so that tells me that what we do matter and um, we, what we, we need to continue to nurture and foster and look for this type of relation. And if we're not getting that text from an, uh, someone that's loyal you know, to us or, or someone we've been shooting for for a long time, maybe it's up to us to say, hey, how are you? So I think it's a two-way street. I think this time is shouldn't be wasted. We should be keeping on top of our, our clients, just like how agents are encouraged to, to nurture their relations with their sellers and buyers. We need to continue that relation and nurture that with our clients. So, you know, what, what you're talking about is, is finding other ways to use, uh, use your time, right? And you know, what you had said about the agent reaching out to you and just saying like, Sam, how are you? I'm seeing that with a lot of our top agents and, and you know, a lot of the photographers I work with, you're, they're sort of recycling the time to reestablish or strengthen personal connections, which is probably a really great investment of time. Um, guys, we're going to take a quick break while the panelists go ahead and upvote questions. They didn't know I was going to ask them to do that. They're going to hit the QA button and thumbs up any of the questions that they see of interest because you guys are submitting a lot. And I am going to take 10 seconds to talk about the REP Cares uh, GoFundMe. And By the way, we're at $4,819, guys. Wow, you refreshed, you refreshed a second after I me and so it funny. went up. That is awesome. And guys, don't forget, we've got giveaways, right? The Running Gun Workflow by Gary Castle, Shooting Spaces, entire webinar co collection, The Art of Real Estate Cin Cinematography by Jordan Powers and Nick S., whose name I can't pronounce, The Art and Science of Great Pop Composition by Mr. Tony Colangelo, Mastering Real Estate Photography by Gary Gomez, and two Pro EDU one-year subscriptions, which is massive. So 
take a second now or take a second in a little while and consider kicking in. We are so close to goal that it's, it's like ridiculous. Um, Don't stop there. Don't stop yeah, yeah. There. Yeah, Rich is going to mud wrestle somebody or something if we, if we beat goal. Anything you guys want, whatever it takes, I'm there for you. I'm a giver. So. Awesome. So, guys, I don't know about you. Um, we can circle back to 3D. There's a lot on there, but I think, I think we've got to change it up a little. And yeah. I see a great question from Melissa Wagoner who asks, this is like one of my favorite questions because I've made so many bad mistakes. I could talk about it for a while. She asks, what's the biggest mistake you've made in your business? Whether it's gear that you've bought, marketing, what do you wish you knew early on in your career? Hmm. So I think that's, that's a fun question. Um, be brave when you answer. I have some. Right. Wayne Capilli, go. So I'm going to go off, I'm going to kind of rip off what Sam said, that Although I do real estate photography, my goal is not to sell a house. My goal is for my agents, who are, who are my clients, for them to get the next listing. So I will do the service at the level that they want so they can get more business. And it just so happens that the things that they're selling are, is real estate. So my client is not for me. My goal in my photography is not to sell a house. It is to get my client his next project. So going it from that way, um, the thing about business relationship, and, and it, it, this actually goes with the 3D thing, is that I'm 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 in fear that I'm not get get to, I won't get to see my clients anymore because you know we all we are doing things by text. Um, they can't open the door for me. I, it's these it's these things that or, or, that has it's normal normal contact that I'm not like, getting from my clients. Not mo not money wise, but just the human contact and the relationship that I have with my clients that I'm concerned about. So. I got some. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> um, I think that um, kind of the same thing, or at, least, at least the same kind of idea is like, I think that paying attention <clears throat> probably less to the product and, and your editing and your lens that you use and what camera you got and everything else and really trying to focus on customer service and um, trying to do everything you can to make their lives easier because that's what that's what sells in in everything like your convenience is king so is as, as beneficial as you can make yourself to them and what it what it like you just basically become part of their team and you just got to keep that that friendly vibe going and try to do what you can. And I mean, there's nothing wrong with charging them for for higher quality service. And that's where a lot of it comes into play too. Is you can make more money by offering, adding more value to to what you do for them. So okay, so to answer to her question, the worst thing that I've ever done business wise is not was not was not was not, um, was not returning a phone call years ago which would have been a good, which I realized then now that it would have been a very good client and I simply didn't return the phone call. It's a simple, but a really bad mistake. All right. So the, best, the worst mistake ever. And for the few of you here who are on a PFRE panel who uh, answered the same question, I'm about to top you all back in. Uh, <laughs> and and I've, I've said this in, on the podcast and I should be embarrassed to tell this story, but I'm not because I think it's good to inspire people to learn from it. Back in 2011, when I was doing weddings full time, I was about six or seven months into my wedding business and I did not have a proper backup system in place. And I'm sure you all know where this is going, but I lost five weddings for brides and grooms on a hard drive because I was not properly backed up. And wow. Yeah. And those, it cost my, well, it didn't cost me, it cost my insurance company over $30,000. It was a five-month stress and headache-filled time, the, probably the worst five months of my life. Um, and I've obviously learned since then, and I have four backups of everything everywhere all over the place, the cloud, four hard drives here. But um, yeah, those five unfortunate people do not have wedding photos still because of a major, major screw-up I did. So... Go a back week up later, stuff. Brian Berkowitz got into architectural and real estate photography. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I don't, I don't. Can anybody top that or or come on the approach? No, <laughs> no, 
Okay, I'll give that to you, Brian. It's yours. Do the house. I'll, I'll just, put on my crown. I just started started the house and I uh, started shooting real estate about 10 years ago. I go and I'm shooting the house and I'm in the front, the foyer, real large place. I'm backing up and I hit a little table by the door and a little pot, a little like, and it, bro it broke. And I'm like, oh crap, I could probably sweep it under, but I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll take care of this. And I look and it's from Pottery Barn or someplace like that. And it, and I'm, it, it had a little tag on the bottom. So I bring it up to the agent and he, he, this guy freaks out and he's like, you got to tell the owners, you got to do this. I'm like, okay, okay, well, it's just the pottery barn. I went up to, and the woman and the husband, the owners, and I said, I'm really sorry. I, I have insurance, but I broke this little, little piece and I showed her and she starts crying. And I'm like, I, again, I'll pay. She says, it's not the money. It's not that. Turns out her son was killed in in the service and that was the last gift he gave to them and that was the only thing i've ever really broken in real estate and my heart was broken and i kept in touch with them for years and uh i just you know it's it's we'd be careful man because you never know what is going to be have insurance but be careful because it, it's not even the things that money can buy it's things that money can't buy so you know just just be careful out there well, I me... thought COVID was going to get you down. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, back, back a little bit more towards business. I'll, I'll say when I first started, I was doing this part-time. Um, and one of the things that I really didn't do at the beginning was truly understanding how much it cost for my business. Understanding, you know, looking at rent, gear rental. You're not charging yourself rental, but understand how much that gear, how often you need to replace it, um, how much everything costs and how much you really want to make. Um, I had to do a hard look at that and I do that on a pretty frequent basis when I went full time and it helps you ask for the pricing that you want because there's always somebody that's willing to, you know, get paid equivalent to be working at McDonald's, which, you know, $15 an hour is not bad sometimes, but it, that information gives you the ability to say, this is how much I have to charge to send my kids to college, to pay for my rent and to make this business long-term and to have that certain FU fund that, that Mike Kelly likes to talk about so that you can walk away from jobs or handle these crazy things that are going on right now. So that's the most important thing I think everybody needs to do in their business. It gives you confidence to say, no, I really do need $200 to shoot this house. No, I can't do it for 75. And you can't do that until you know your numbers. And um, that that's an important piece. So. Yeah. yeah, I'd say the biggest mistake I ever made business wise was not having a good accountant and uh, doing my taxes right, because that'll get you <laughs> bad, I think, bad. I think, every, I think everyone's going to put their hands well, uh, up on that. We, we just, uh, we just, we, <laughs> really, really quick, uh, $5,129. Uh, $5, wow. Yes. Hey. All right, awesome. Then on that note, I want to thank everybody for their time tonight. We are done. Let's uh, <laughs> wrap this up. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, so, um, yeah, guys. Five two two nine. This is freaking awesome. Thank you so much. What were you gonna say, D? Um, I was gonna jump on something that D said. Um, so two two mistakes. One was a small one, but a painful one, which was locking my cell phone inside the house as I went out onto the deck, and nobody was around, and mm -hmm. I had to drop about eight feet to get off the deck. So that was a small one cell phone is now with me at all times. Um, but the bigger one in terms of business was buying equipment that I thought I should have in order to do the job that needed to be done. And for me, the big thing was, you know, having all this DSLR, um, gimbal, all of that for doing video, when for me, a smaller, lighter setup was better. And I wish that I'd stuck more with my sense of what was right for my product and my business before buying extra stuff. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. I preach that all the time. Less sure. is more for sure. Mm -hmm. and, but the gear is fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm in this to buy gear. Yes. It's hard to find, it's hard to find the balance, but yeah, I, uh, case in point, you know, 
I, sh- I shoot with speed lights still. I haven't bought an 8200 and I'm still surviving miraculous, miraculously. Um, but yeah, no, people talk about the gear all the time and it is really fun, but you don't need much. It's crazy how little you can get by with. Well, you need a full frame though, right, Wayne? Well, guys, don't forget, you need, you, need to, you need to create some expenditures so that you can write it off for your taxes, right? Uh. <laughs> so. I keep on telling my wife that, but yeah, she's not. That's what that. works for me. <laughs> All right, guys, we're going we're gonna to switch topics real fast. Vin- Vince, I'm going to interrupt you for a sec. Plug. Vince. Absolutely um, not. A couple of people asked if you were one of the few who donated anonymously forward me your confirmation email and we'll add you to the eligibility list for the giveaways. So just send it to Brian at shooting spaces.net and we'll add you to the list because we want In you fact, to be- yeah, if you guys could take a break and do that right away, because we want to get that in tonight. For yeah. Sure, right? So a couple of people asked, they donated previously anonymously, just forward me your confirmation email and we'll add you to the list. Awesome. Awesome. So yeah, that's a, a great reminder. Again, it's gofundme.com slash REP dash cares, or you can look at Rich Baum's screen if you've got gallery mode on. <laughs> um, guys, we're at $5,229. No, $5,394. Jesus Christ, it changes by the moment. That's insane. That That's like 20,000 Canadian, by the way. <laughs> eh? <laughs> eh? Okay, All right. right. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to ask a question for, on behalf of Daniel Francis, um, Daniel asks with your website, is it best to have images separated by interior and exteriors or by work with architects versus work with interior designers? And what you know, Tony, I, I, I've seen, I've seen you give almost an hour explaining a lot of great thinking about this. What is your, what is your sort of nutshell answer? Uh, Right off the top of my head, I mean, there's a 30,000 foot view answer. uh, And that is, it depends, in terms of your brand, it depends what you're trying to communicate uh, to your marketplace. Uh, If you were to twist my arm, uh, I would say in a perfect world, uh, there would be a blend of interiors and exteriors. And uh, again, in a perfect world, I wouldn't have um, architecture and interior design work uh, on my real estate website and, and vice versa. I, I would have two separate websites. Okay. <laughs> Does anybody else want to field that question as well? Do you have any ideas to the contrary? I do. And okay. wait with, uh, with Tony's sentiment on there. If, if the business models are different, it should be separate websites. That's been my view of it. And I don't have, um, for example, my, my personal website is not geared toward real estate agents. It's strictly architecture and interiors. And I don't have a single real estate photograph on there. Cause I think that would actually work against me, um, when trying to appeal to that particular market. And that works both ways. If you're, if you look, if your website looks like you have, you know, $5,000 photo shoots on it, um, it's probably not going to do a good job of grabbing a real estate agent's attention. Yeah. I actually don't have any photos of real estate photography at all on my real estate photography website. So I think it all depends on your brand and Tony could probably go on about that all day. But, um, so are you, are you going with like more of the sort of uh, you're showing off the architectural stuff, Jordan, because it's sort of aspirational for the real estate agents. What do you, what do you have on your website? No, no. I have, I have nothing. It's, it's, it's all. Um, so my real estate photography business is kind of a, it's a strange model. It's more like service based. So it's more like I told it more as like a, a marketing partner. So when you go to my web, my real estate photography website, it's, it's me working with agents. It's photos of me and other agents working together. And there is a port, there's a, there's a hidden portfolio link, but it's the people don't hire me for the photos. They hire me for the service that I provide. So I don't have any photos of real estate. So as far as, and people continue to hire me, even new clients, um, my arc, my, sorry, I was just, I was just going to say my personal brand is all photography. It's, it's my, for architecture and interiors. It's, that's, it's all focused on that. Yeah. So Jordan is speaking to exactly the point that I made about what are you trying to communicate uh, to the marketplace? Uh, Jordan has uh, made a very uh, definitive decision about about that and his website speaks to it. 
So he's a real estate photographer, uh, but really he's, uh, he's positioning himself uh, as a strategic partner. So if with that positioning, uh, there really is no need for, uh, for real estate photography on the website. So that's a, you know, a very, very bold decision, but that's why I started my answer, Vince, starting at 30,000 feet. Uh, it really depends what you want to communicate to the marketplace. Let me, let me come at this a little different angle. Um, your, your website really is kind of doing two things. You're presenting yourself and your brand to clients, but you're also presenting yourself to Google and Bing. Um, and one of the things I did with my website um, when I really started focusing on ranking better in Google was um, trying to focus and trying to focus on um, particular keywords that I wanted to be ranked for. Um, so I really like my first page is just architectural and commercial photography. I don't have anything real estate. I don't have drone on the front page because that's my front page. That's what I want to focus on. So it, to answer your question about your galleries, your gallery words rank images don't so you need something to talk about and those galleries can be separate on what your keywords are trying to rank on and align those with those keywords so that you are um how can i say you're supporting those keywords and that ranking in google you can do both but it does take a certain amount of thought process you're, you really have two audiences the search engines and your clients You've got to have the search engines to get your clients to your website, but once they're there, then your brand better be speaking. So you've got to, you've really got to think about it in two different ways. So not too many keywords, not too many categories on the same page. Awesome. So before we move on to the next question, Rich, do you want to give a quick update on how the fundraiser is doing? Because you seem to get more accurate numbers than me. I'm like lagging behind by two minutes. Uh, Rich, you're muted. So am I. Maybe GoFundMe is in California. Vince, we get it a couple of seconds later. Okay. Um, as it stands, we're at five thousand six hundred and fourteen dollars. That so is up awesome. Thousand dollars. I want to just say one thing about websites, especially to the new people in this that go, "Do I need a website?" Be sure that you don't have a website that is wedding photography and real estate photography and sports photography. Um, be sure that you have a website just for real estate photography because realtors don't care. They don't want you to be successful with other people, with weddings, whatever. They want to know that you're there for them when they need it. And all they care about is real estate. That's my two cents worth. For sure. And that echoes, uh, you know, what Tony was saying about sort of identifying and speaking to the audience. Um, guys, I want to switch it over to let's talk tactical. Let's talk on site. Um, you know, next question comes from Philip Andrews, and I'm going to shoot it over at Gary Gomez first, because I know uh, Gary shared some insights with me, which I found excellent. What are your best, what are one or two of your best tips for speeding up your workflow? Oh. Right. Um, okay. That's a can of worms. Um, a couple things that worked well for me is uh, practice more than anything else. And that just comes with, with time, but being intentional with how you practice, paying attention to what you're doing so that things become a little more intuitive to you. Um, I talked about that a little bit for my talk uh, at the PFRE conference in November. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really big deal. So um, you get to become more familiar with it. It becomes more instinctual, a little bit more second nature. Um, the other part to that is studying the work of people that you admire that's going to help inform the decisions you make when you're composing and things like that. And again, going back to practice, that really speeds you up. If you start, um, you know, walking into a room and things start hitting you right away without you having to think about it too much, that's a good way to speed up, but that takes a long time to build up that muscle. Apart from that, I think the single biggest thing for speeding up workflow in my experience has been coming up with like a repeatable, process for shooting your photos so you're not sort of figuring out the puzzle every room that you shoot or every shot that you compose because um, you can light a room 10 different ways and get you know 10 different results but very similar to one another if you're kind of doing things in a similar fashion but if you could sort of strip down your process 
to just what makes the biggest impact and not focus your time on things that aren't going to make a big impact because you know it's real estate photography it's high volume you have to be quick you have to be efficient if you want to be profitable so you've got to make some compromises um so yeah letting i guess that also means letting go of perfection because that'll be the enemy of good every time um and just so if you focus on the most important parts of the photo and learn how to do it in a repeatable nature, uh, that's going to be the best way to be as quick as possible with it. And, you know, defining what those qualities are that you want your photos to have so that you can focus on those and not waste time on anything that doesn't fit within that description. I think makes a lot of sense. Um, I want to Brandon Cooper. What, what, what is a tip or tip or two that you can share with us in terms of speeding up your workflow? Honestly, I would have to echo pretty much everything that Gary just said. The other thing for me that works, and it's a bit, I have to preface it a little because my market's a little bit different. I'm in a smaller market. It's a very cookie cutter market. So we don't see homes much bigger than three or 4,000 square feet very often. So I was able to develop a system that works for almost everything that I shoot. I know that's not reasonable for everybody in different markets. Like, you know, Tony's in Victoria, you could shoot five homes a day and probably never shoot the same floor plan in, in two months. Up here, I shoot the same homes all the time. So I have a system in place and I, and I know how to um, navigate those floor plans and all the challenges that come with it. The other thing for me that's been really valuable, two things. Uh, number one was really cutting down my gear, figuring out what the absolute least amount of gear that I needed to, to try into a property to do a good job and again I have a cookie cutter market so it's a little bit different but I can get away with you know a tripod a camera one lens maybe two and two to three speed lights I'm in and out of that house I'm not lugging gear in and that really helps and then the other thing I decided this on real early on because again I shoot very high volume so having those those little conversations those little five minute meet and greets at the beginning of every shoot really added up over time if I was shooting four or five six homes in a day that could easily be half an hour, 45 minutes. So I implemented a rule really early on. Uh, and I know this would definitely ruffle some feathers and some people disagree with the idea, but I made a rule that the house has to be hundred percent vacant before I show up. Um, again, might not work in markets that have a little more complicated real estate where maybe you do need to touch base with the agent a bit more or the, or the homeowner. But for me, it works really well. And that allows, I mean, if I were to do the math on how much time I've saved avoiding that five or 10 minute little bit of small talk prior to a shoot, I mean, it would, it's huge. And that's what's allowed me to keep my prices in line and competitive, make good margins, but not really waste anybody's time. So that's kind of the best thing I could say. And like I said, it may not work for everybody, but I know there's other markets out there that it would work well for. Yeah, and, and to piggyback on that, Brandon, you have a super high volume business. Aren't you doing like six or seven houses a day? It depends. Yeah. I mean, right now, obviously not, but I mean, it's not, a, it's not unreasonable to shoot a hundred homes in a month easily. Yeah. Yeah, so those minutes add up pretty quick. Big time. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask a clarification question for both Brandon and Gary and then kind of roundtable for everyone here. So when you talked about um, sort of defining or having a consistent style, um, are you both generally shooting sort of the same format pretty consistently? Like, let's say 90% of your shots, you're using, you know, X number of exposures, right? It's a range, let's say, but it's a tight range. Generally, it's one speed light or two, but it's not figuring out each time. That's that's what you're saying, right? So you can ultimately yeah. edit your images the same way. Yeah. Is that is that sort of the same across the board for people here? Would you say that 80 or 90% of your photographs are technically taken from very much the same format? Yes. All right. So for those of you watching at home, not in gallery view, I got a lot of nods. Um, Remember, guys, you're only going to show up on screen if you make some noise. So, okay, it seems that generally people are, you have a format, you know, Gary Castle, when you go and shoot stills, you're doing X, and generally X doesn't change unless you've got really good reason, right? Right. Um, okay. Most of the time, I, I do a quick walkthrough of the place before I get there, or usually I'll kind of know what I'm in for, because I shoot a crazy range of kinds of houses. Um, from the low level stuff all the way up to this crazy stuff that you don't even need lights sometimes. Um, but yeah, 
it, it's for the most part it doesn't change though i mean lighting is lighting you know and composition is composition kind of I think you need to have those methods down pat in order to be able to get in the head of this house quickly, you know, especially if you're a volume shooter like Brandon, I can't even imagine shooting that type of volume in a day. I would lose my mind. So I'll give you credit, Brandon. But um, I think you need those, those, I guess, familiar techniques where it's almost mu muscle memory, where you can just go in, do what you need to do and get out, you know, unless you're shooting luxury real estate or, or you're just a really good salesman, none of us are making huge, 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 huge money for real estate shoots. So, you know, the, the point is to try to go in and get out. I don't want to say as quick as possible, but you know, you want to, you want to get in, you want to get your stuff done, get your shots and, and move on to the next one. So I think having those, those techniques down is what enables you to do that. Well, I would say it's also giving yourself the ability to, you know, I always say to the folks I work with that your most important seconds on any shoot are the ones that you're spending thinking about a composition, not thinking about your settings, thinking about, you know, what you're going to crank, what to, or are you going to take 12 exposures at four? No, get that out of the way, build the muscle memory, and then concentrate on composition. Absolutely. Um, so Jay Veld asks, who in the panel runs a business just doing photography or primarily photography? And how do you feel, how do they feel not about, how do they feel about adding other services like 360 video drone, uh, very much pointed at the Gary's, right? Gary Gomez and Gary Castle. Um, are you guys, are both of you generally just photography? Well, no, Gary's, you're doing 360s, right? Castle. Uh, we do everything. Yes. Okay. Um, we we try to be like a one stop shop um, at the moment. Like we, I got a team of guys. Uh, we all do video, photos, three Ds. Everybody's you know kind of outfitted with the same things, but we offer different levels of service too. Like I was saying, like um, they might shoot more of a kind of like regular type of house around where we live at, but then I have clients that you know want this kind of luxury look. And I might spend an entire day at one house. Um, so it, it, it does change, but um, yeah, it's, but we offer everything. So like if, if I'm spending, you know, we could do video and Matterport and good photos in the house and, and then do Twilight, it, would, it takes all day anyways, you know? Um, but I think that adding more services to what you can do and what you can do for the, for your clients, it's better. It's just, just all adds to more money. Um, and I think that building a team of guys really helps to doing it alone is tough. So, um, I've recently partnered up and we're able to accomplish a lot more like that. Now, Gary, when you say building a team of guys, are you talking about, individuals who own the context of a shoot for a home or are you bringing in several folks in a given home right here's my guy who's going to run and do video we've got somebody with a bird in the air which which kind of style are you working um we we have we kind of just do it all at once so um like i was saying we kind of have these bundles where we sell them like the three the triangle services, the photos, the video, and the, and the 3D stuff. Um, so we can really round out their marketing and then we create a website for them and it looks really nice and it's filled out. Um, the sellers love it. And I mean, it's just, but yeah, we, we try to send one guy to one house. Um, and like when I'm training them, like I go and shadow them and kind of coach them into being able to do everything. But um, we have people that are at different levels though. So we kind of have to delegate who gets what job. Um, but it's, it's super cool having a team of guys that like, and I mean, or girls or whatever, but like a team of people that can accomplish, you know, this, this as like a business, you know, um, and they're all full employees. We don't do the subcontractor thing anymore. Um, that's been super challenging. Um, so it's, but it's interesting. It's, it keeps it fun to me. Yeah, I, so my answer to that would be, it, it's kind of, it depends on your business model and what your goals are. And that's entirely up to you. Um, I, uh, I can only speak for myself. Personally, I don't have any interest in video. I've, I've actually tried it. Uh, when I first started my real estate photography business, I did video for about um, a year and a half. 
bought a little bit of equipment and every time I did it, I hated it just a little bit more, uh, even though I was getting better at it. Uh, it's just not something I enjoy. I don't like, the, the, actually the shooting I found kind of enjoyable, still a little bit more tedious than I wanted it to be, but the editing was just, <laughs> no, I don't want to do it. <laughs> so uh, I feel the same way about all the other services. So for me, it's more like a selfish decision, but to the other side of the, the, the point, um, if you can make more profit while you're there, why wouldn't you do it? So I see it, I see it both ways 100%. It depends on what you want to do. If I could take, a, well, this is a perfect example. I just got this thing like a week ago, the, the Ricoh Theta camera. Um, and I just started doing these 360 tours because it's being demanded right now. And I'm just trying to, uh, while both of my businesses have come to a screeching halt and I've had so much, uh, so many canceled photo shoots, the financial ramifications of that are pretty big for me. Um, so this is just one way I can bridge the gap a little bit. And that's totally what fueled that decision. And my intention is to sell this thing as soon as I can once all of this blows over because I don't enjoy it. It's, um, it's not something I find fun. And uh, to that point, if, I'm, if my rates are good, if, if to what Dee was saying earlier, if you understand your numbers and your cost of doing business, you can set your rates to do whatever job you wanna do and still be profitable. So for me, I set my rates at a level that get me exactly where I wanna be in my business so that my numbers look the way I want them to, doing exactly what I love to do and not having to do any of the other stuff. I'm happier that way, even if I'm leaving some money on the table. So yeah, it's, it's a personal decision, but um, if you don't mind doing it, the money's great. So I think I would say that it's, um, going back to what Jordan said, it, it's about whether you want to be a photographer or a marketing partner. Um, and for me, I want to make sure that if any client comes to me, one, they have no reason to go anywhere else. And two, that my first thought in working with them is service over sales. And what is it that they need that I'm in a position to perhaps find for them? And then the next level is, is this a product that I either have the skills or have the ability to outsource to somebody else or to provide them? But I want to be in that position of being a marketing partner rather than a photographer. Yeah, can I just chime, I just want to chime in really quick. Uh, kind of talking a little bit to what Gary was saying, like regarding video specifically, like, and this might transition the conversation a different way, but like when it comes to video specifically, like even beyond real estate, just like, again, I mentioned, I was trying to focus more on architecture. Um, I'm trying to do more architecture video, uh, like real estate video is one thing, but like, I think architecture video is starting to becoming, starting to become, um, something that wasn't necessarily something before. I don't know. It's, it's, it, but it's, it's that whole marketing partner thing. Like at least where I am, all the architects here have their photographers. There's, and they, there's a, a, you know, 10, 10 or so major or main photographers that people will go toward or will pick from. And I'm kind of like at the bottom of the list. So like I'm trying to innovate and think of ways that I can step outside of just saying, Hey, I shoot architecture photography. So if I can offer clients something that's valuable to them, that's still creatively interesting enough to me, then I'm, I do that. And I think you can do the same thing with real estate. Same like with 360, like I don't intend on being a 360 photographer to Gary's point. It involves no creative muscle at all, but I, I, I do see, I, I do see, I, I enjoy the business of things. I just enjoy innovating and trying new things and seeing what it turns into. So I, I don't know if that triggers any other thoughts, but that's kind of like where my mind went as you guys were talking about this stuff. That makes that's sense. how I feel too. It's, it's like, why not offer more if you can? I mean, um, the way that the 360 stuff is turned into now, those Ricos make the, the job so fast that I don't, I mean, I don't necessarily think you'd become a 360 photographer. It's like 15 minutes of a job. You know what I mean? It doesn't take very long. 
Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't turn it into just that, but I've also found that offering video, I never had any intentions on becoming like a videographer either, but, um, I got, had to get into it because my clients wanted it. And then once we got into, we started doing what Tacey was talking about with the phone and stuff in the Moby. And that's changed the entire game for us too. We're able to produce things at a price that the realtors are just loving it. So now we're able to beef it up. It still takes no time. You get all your ducks in a row, all your processors in a row, and you just, you end up with a steady workflow. Like Gary was talking about, you have all this stuff lined up and, your systems together and that's that's a great way to just speed everything up and take care of everybody at the same time so, one of the challenges though right um so we've talked about a lot of things we've touched on 360s i threw drones in we've talked about video we've talked about the 3d tours um those are a lot of things that can be done very quickly but you start to add on all the things that you're doing right and you know you sort of hear the counter argument like brandon cooper has isolated himself using social distance already by insisting that his agents don't show up on the shoots. How do you, how do you find the time to manage that stuff and then also manage like social media, like Matt Stallone, dude, how are you in business and being successful and finding time to do the social media stuff that like, I'm pretty sure you're posting as we speak. I, I am. Vince. It's a nonstop full-time job. Um, honestly, like we have, you know, and I'm speaking to all of us out there because we're all in this either photographers or real estate or interior designs or what we have such power with our images because obviously without our images, there is no social media. There is no Instagram. There is no Facebook. Uh, well, there's Facebook, but you know, there's no posting of images. Um, you know, the biggest thing for me, for my business in the last eight years has been social media. All my business has been referrals. Um, the biggest thing that I would reach out for all of you that are watching this is Use your images to really get to all these other big brands, you know, Inspire Me Home, The Well-Dressed House. These are people that have 5 million, 2 million, a million, whatever the numbers are. When they post, they're looking for content. Without our stuff, they're not going to have anything to post. So we're all great photographers. We all have these beautiful homes and um, we have the ability to showcase this stuff. And all we ask is for them to credit us. And I can tell you, every time somebody like Inspire Me Home or the well-dressed house that have over millions and millions of followers, I get two, 300 followers out of it. And I've been doing that for like the last eight years. So I highly encourage all of you, if you have some really nice photos, tag, whether it's an architect, excuse me, an architect firm, or whether it's um, a designer or whoever, reach out and just tag some of these people. And you'd be surprised. They want content. A lot of them follow me now. A lot of them message me independently, privately. And they're like, do you have anything new for us? And obviously I want them to be on my side to get my stuff out there as much as possible because it benefits you all. So, you know, going back to having a website, I think what's more important now, a lot of people are looking for your business online. So, you know, that, that would be my tip and suggestion. If anything that you take out of what I can offer you tonight. And I'm still like, you know, literally I've been doing this all night, putting my Instagram stories. It's a full-time job. Yeah. Were we just all on like a Facebook live with you? Is that what was going on? I definitely, I caught you. That, that was on Instagram. I'm, I'm totally an Instagram guy. Okay. I, I do everything and everything on Instagram. I do post on Facebook as well, just not as much as Instagram. Only dude on the panel who takes more selfies than I do. Excellent. <laughs> Wayne Capilli, Justin the Designer asks, I have one 8200 and one A6400 Sony camera. Is that enough to shoot most homes? And if so, can you, can you give me pointers on shooting with just one light for a setup like that? Well, regardless of the camera, um, with shooting with one light is you just have to go into a space, you have to feel where the light is coming from, and simply light the dark area. That's it. <laughs> it was funny, that pause, I was like, is, is he really just going to, you're, you're going to make it sound that easy? It, it really is that easy. I mean, we, and what we do is we actually put strobes in other places, but the gist of the basis of my photography is, I want natural light. I want to keep the flow and the feel of that light. So is you, you have to dissect where the light is coming from. Um, there's natural areas where it's dark and you just literally light and fill the areas that need light. And it's, it's really as simple as that. It, so when you work with, with that, any camera works with that kind of um, lighting philosophy. So awesome. A6000, whatever lens you're using, um, it, it's, yeah, it, camera's not, camera's not important 
exposure is. Absolutely. And yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's fine. I was, I was almost not going to ask that question because I've heard, I've heard at least four or five people on this panel uh, elsewhere talk about, you know, ultimately you can, you can create compelling photographs with any camera. There's, there's, mm -hmm. you know, the, uh, the joke about full frame versus non full frame, right. Or crop sensor. It, it's really just a matter of how you're using the tools and, Ultimately, yeah, you're right. It's it's about creating or what did you call it? You had the talk called farming light light farming, light, light farming. Yeah, yeah. I, I I I do. It, you know, from, from the talk, it really is. It's like I I I want to feel when you go into a room. A lot of times, it's very automatic that people will put strobes in, and all they really need to do is just sit back, let your eyes adjust, even if the room is dark, and see where the light's coming from. It's very noticeable, really where the dark area is and you just simply light the dark area or expose expose for it in your camera and control the highlights with your flash so i think the you other always make it sound so easy i know right yeah <laughs> we're all nodding and sweating bullets at the same time i think the other part of that question was do you need can you do it with just one 8200 or there's another question also talking about getting a more powerful flash um I do a lot of commercial work and I use the 8200. I've got a second one that I will use and set up and I actually like using the two 8200s versus pulling out the 600 or my 360s. Um, and so I, I think from a house standpoint, yes, one 8200 is, is really all you need. You're not trying to light the entire thing. You're just trying to supplement the natural lighting, just pretty much what Wayne just said. So um, I, I, I think that that's, that's plenty for, for shooting, so. Well, on a, okay, on a technical kind of thing, if you're in a room and if you're going to fill a room with light, it's like if you're, if you're in a room that's 20 feet long and you're in the back of the room with an AD 200, no, your flash is not gonna be powerful enough to, flat, to, put, to light the far part of the room. So put the flash in the far part of the room. And once you do that, the, the 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 amount of power that you need to to lighten the darkened area is far less than 200 watt seconds. You can do it with 80 watt seconds. You can you know that's to get f8 in an area in a, in a, on f8 in a normal room. You would have to put your flash on the floor and be like a quarter power, and you'd have to f8 in that part of the room. And you you wouldn't have to worry about trying to light the room from where your where the camera position is because you have to light where you want the light to be. So when you when you start working in those kind of terms, you don't need that much light because the light's not traveling that far. Now, speaking of light, totally awkward question when taken out of context, but Sam Chen, are you a lights on or lights off type of guy? You got to unmute yourself for this, buddy. <laughs> You're muted still. I think what he's oh, saying you made is him made speechless, too, oh, Jake. Personal. Jake Denton. Uh, Sam Chen, unmute your mic if you're going to answer that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're blushing, dude. You're, I mean, photographically, are you a lights on in the house or lights off? In the house? <laughs> you know, that sounds like a boxer's or brief question. And, you know, I can stand up right now because I'm kind of full Monty right now. <laughs> so uh, to answer your question, it really depends on the client because one of my best loyal clients, he absolutely requires the lights on no matter what. And I do it, even though some of the homes should be lights off, he will want it on. And I can kind of see where he comes from. Um, I kind of like lights on for a lot of cases because um, it, a lot of the homes that I shoot are uh, luxury homes, custom build and they have amazing light fixtures. And that is absolutely part of the architect and builder's vision is how the light adds to the space. So for, I think for real estate, I will do that. I will keep the lights on. It's not like I'm gonna have a stager or, or interior designer saying, hey, that's not the right color. In fact, um, color is, accuracy is not as crucial for real estate and, and, and particularly luxury real estate. But I think uh, recently I shot a home where I didn't want to touch any light switches because of, you know, the pandemic. And I thought the homes, whoops, I just dropped the mic. I thought the, home, the homes looked great. 
but um, it was sort of out of necessity that I shot it with, that, with the lights off. And I think I'm going to encourage more and more of my uh, clients to shoot, to have me shoot it with lights off. But I think at the end of the day, you have to please your clients. It's what they ask of you, what they want. And so if they want it, the lights on, you should keep the lights on. Um, but, you know, I, I think I can make both look good. And I think it's important for us to ultimately be problem solvers and not come up with, with um, excuses. And instead, just come up with a workflow that will make both look good. So the short okay, answer okay, I, is, it depends. Well, I did a workshop and um, this, is, this has to do with on and lights on or off. So one of my students, when he gets into the house, the first thing he does is, Alexa, turn on the lights. He doesn't, he, he doesn't know if the lights are on, but that it's, it's like, yeah, that's really kind of a thing they do when, when you go into a house now. You actually just go in, blurt out to Siri or Alexa to turn lights on or turn the radio on. But in, in, when something like that, you actually have control over the lights, which will help you speed through your shoot. You know what I love doing when I went into a house is I usually say, Alexa, <laughs> set alarm for 4.30 a.m. <laughs> So I'm, I'm hoping I'm I, just, chat I just totally and, screwed somebody for tomorrow morning. You did. I'm reading the chat. We're going <laughs> to pause, pause for a second. And we are going to set a quick reminder. So look, guys, in 15 minutes, we are going to switch over to the raffle portion of tonight. So Jordan, that means you've got to get ready to be really, really nerdy and awesome. Um, it also means everybody here has 15 minutes to get their, uh, get their donations in if you're choosing to donate. Um, I am going to ask Tacey to talk really quick, give us 25 words about the organization that we're supporting tonight, Tacey. Oh, the organization. Um, well, first of all, what I want to say is that um, I, I really wanted to find something that was as pointed as possible at those people who are experiencing the most dire consequences from this. And to me, that was the health workers and vulnerable people. So I went to Charity Navigator, because I'm a big believer in getting the money directly to the source, not to admin and overhead. And this particular one had a four star rating. So it's a COVID-19 directed, um, directed charity. Thank you. I forgot to unmute myself. Thank you very much, Alexa. Oh my God. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> That's By the amazing. way, Vince, I'm reading the chat and you're making everyone's Alexas go crazy right now. <laughs> I know. It's, this is my favorite thing. This is actually the, the reason I've agreed to this tonight. Um, <laughs> thank you for entertaining me. Yeah. James Alexa, Asper play asks, cat sounds. <laughs> <laughs> Alexa, play cat sounds. <laughs> uh, so James Albert asks, do you find it hard to balance the speed of shooting versus quality of composition and lighting? Right. And, you know, again, a lot of familiar faces from the PFRE uh, convention where, you know, one of my favorite takeaways was Scott Hargis's slow the fuck down. And it's not just so I have an excuse to say fuck a whole lot. Um, who here struggles with sort of finding that balance, right? You want to, you know, Brandon, you're, you're, you're shooting volume, but you're also making art. How do you, how do you balance that? Is it the muscle memory that Gary was talking about earlier? I, well, there's a couple I, things. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go, Brandon. Yeah, for me, again, I'm in a unique scenario. I mean, I, I think with a lot of people, um, composition can come naturally to you, but you might not necessarily know why you like something, the way something looks. But then as you learn more about composition and you realize there's actually some psychology behind it. And what the, the reason that it looks good to you right now with your eyes is because it's making your brain relax and, and feel good. So there's that element. Once you kind of learn some of those details, it makes things a little bit easier. But again, I have to go back. I personally am in a very unique market where I don't get challenged with a lot of layouts and compositions that would maybe challenge me as much as some of the other folks. Like again, you know, Gary in San Diego, could be shooting the craziest house in the world one day and then something small the next day same with tony so for me you know it's i can't really speak to it that much i've got a system in place i don't get challenged all that much in, in and you know 
my world now is more about the business side of the real estate photography than it is about the art. I, I, I hate saying that because I'm still very passionate about creating good images, but it's a reality. Uh, I'm in a very secluded, isolated market, and I need to focus on the business side more than I do the art because the majority of my clients are doing that themselves. So I need to meet their needs there. So again, a little bit unique in my scenario, but that's how, how it is for me. Yeah, I'd have to agree, Brandon. It's it's funny how your business kind of evolves and changes. Like, you know, we, we grew into a, a team of seven of us now, and it's just become about business. Now it's about media getting, you know, um, volume. And, you know, I try to get my team to do all that stuff. But then myself, I try to pull myself to taking some time to do some of the other stuff. But it's hard because it's like you said, now it's all, all about turning business and volume to the max that you can for what we do. Um, you know, I think that changes for everybody. The, the bigger you grow, the more challenges you have. And as you, as you grow, you learn how to develop and deal with different situations for sure. And I'd like to say, um, you know, I've, I've said it many times that I think, especially with when I coach newer photographers, they're telling me, well, it's taken me four hours to shoot and five hours to edit. Well, I think everybody's got to learn. You get, as, as we said, uh, Gary Gomez said, uh, we get faster with repetition. You'll get better. You will get better. You will get faster. It's just logical. If you're not, you're doing something wrong. But I think you've got to make your day. You've got to call your shots. You can spend the time when you have it. And I, I urge everybody to try and do the best work you can, but you might not be able to do it on every shoot. You might have to just try and do the best you can and compromise, unfortunately, and I'm talking about the newer people getting into just real, strictly real estate. But I urge people also, one thing we learned at the PFRE conference is take some time to do at least one shot on a shoot that is for you. Take, if you're in the kitchen and you're shooting wide, do a shot. Uh, turn the camera on its vertically, uh, God forbid, and do a shot, a, a, de a, a detail shot of a, of a stove. And do something for yourself, but that's the, those are the days that you have a little extra time. And uh, remember for me, if I get a house that I'm really digging, I'm taking a lot longer on it, but I have that freedom because that's my kind of a day. But if you need to make your day, uh, choose the times you're going to spend to get the quality you want. And if you don't have that time, get over it and try and just do the best you can. And uh, you know, get, have a life that you can live and balance the two. So. And don't forget, Rich, I think a good point too is change your lens. Get away from always shooting wide. God forbid, put on, no. Put on no. a 24, put on a 50 mil, put on an 85 and just allow your time to be creative and try some different shots. And a super tip from Scott Hargis years ago, um, if you can move the furthest back you can and zoom in if you're using a zoom lens, that's gonna be a huge tip to help with perspective. perspective so. I wanted, I wanted to add something on, um, I guess, a psychological perspective, uh, especially for our viewers and listeners uh, who are shooting uh, a lot of houses during the day. Uh, it's extremely important, as Rich just said, as others have, have echoed, it's, it's extremely important to do things for you uh, at a shoot, every shoot. Uh, I wouldn't wait two or three shoots to find uh, a shot that I want to do for me. At, at, at every shoot, I would want to do at least one shot that I want to experiment a bit. It doesn't have to take half an hour. Uh, it could take a couple of minutes just to think through composition, think through where the light is coming from, and to really, um, that thoughtfulness is really, it'll stimulate a lot more creativity. And what a lot of folks um, aren't really talking about, especially those shooters who are shooting multiple homes in a day, uh, you are putting yourself at tremendous risk of burnout, okay? And if you are not taking the time to satisfy a little corner of your heart or your soul or flexing some uh, creative muscle, um, you are risking that burnout. And if you're relying on your photography to pay the rent or the mortgage, uh, put food on the table, that's a very difficult place to be in. Anyway, food for thought. Yeah, no, thank okay, you so we, much. I, I, and I'm going to just read off one quick thing real quick. Last call for donations. Jordan is going to download all the data and start getting nerdy while we finish this up. 
Uh, Wayne, I cut you off, so bring it. Okay, so since everybody shoots wide, what I would suggest is to get a program called Moldy. So, and essentially it's a program where you, um, <laughs> you can't see it because it, it's, it, it, it's, it's a collage program. So you can actually take your wide angle pictures and actually recrop them, repurpose them, you know, kind of look at the pictures that you've taken and, and go in and look at those, the gems, the, the really nice parts of the room that, that are hidden because, the, because it's so wide. Just literally take your wide angle shots and just start cropping them down. Start with a square, you know, start with odd, with odd um, formats and just kind of go through an, a wide angle image and see all the really beautiful things that are in that room or in that scene. Here, here. Wayne, what was the name of that app one yeah. more time? Moldy? Yeah, yeah type Moldy. it in the... Yeah. yeah, do me a favor, Moldy. Wayne, take a second and you throw it in the chat. Type it in the uh, chat. I can't. I, my, I can't. Okay. Okay, <laughs> okay. it's called oh, Moldy. There we go. It's Casey, Casey did it. Moldy or, or Adobe Spark. Adobe Spark. Okay, awesome. Awesome. So Sam Chen, Gary Castle. Mark Riesbeck says, I love all your picks, especially your Twilight stuff. Can you share one pointer, one tip, one technique before this devolves into something fun and insane? Sam, you go. After you play guitar. Uh, what's the question? Uh, give us one tip for some of the Twilight stuff you're doing. What is, what is like one rule of thumb? Yeah, you know, I, I did read that question. Um, you know, when, when the light kind of comes down, kinda, it's kind of what Mike Kelly describes as that magic hour in that 10 or 15 minute gap, you gotta stop vaping. <laughs> in Las Vegas, man. I was muted. You were. <laughs> you were one, one vice at a time for Vince. Yeah, you're constantly shrouded in a cloud of smoke. But anyway, um, when, you know, like what Mike Kelly was saying that when you're shooting Twilight, there's like 10 to 15 minutes of absolute magic when the ambient level and the sort of the in interior lighting level equals and you can just run around you get a pass from mother nature and you can shoot anything rich that's how i was able to shoot like 24 twilight uh, photos in one day so, i did 30. okay well <laughs> okay it's a contest we're gonna have to beat that but the point of it is that once you lock in into that moment which is about 10 to 15 minutes after sundown you can go nuts, you get a pass, and you can shoot usually like a three exposure bracket. And pretty much everything you shoot is gonna work out well. So you focus on composition, but the lighting's gonna be great. So you let the composition do most of the heavy lifting. And you can probably knock off five to 10 shots very confidently during that time period. You go back to Lightroom, you do the path of least resistance, you do the HDR blend, and you let Lightroom blend the three exposures and it gives you just a little bit more leeway to control the, the highlights and the shadows. And then you can get some amazing stuff just, just you know, with, the, with no light painting, no flash. You put away the flash unless the home is just very dark and doesn't have any landscape lighting. But that's the beauty of that magic hour is that you don't even need to rely on artificial lighting. A lot of times Mother Nature will light up the shadow areas. So that's what I would say is that timing, a little bit of luck, you know, with the weather and just doing three exposure brackets and your your gold. Awesome. Thank you, Sam. Gary Castle, give us something to make our twilights better. Um yeah, I would say waiting for the right time is probably the biggest factor. Um Kind of like when the lights start shining through the windows, that's kind of when I like to get started on getting at least my ambient stuff. But I still use flash in my twilights. Um, and I use it, I try to use it like to enhance the, the light that's there or kind of help out areas where it could use some light. Um, but it, some, it depends on the house though. Like sometimes like uh, me and Sam are kind of in some similar houses sometimes and like, you don't need to bring a flash with you sometimes just because the lighting is just crazy. Like they put so much thought and energy into the build when they 
put the lighting together. Escapes all lit up, the pool's lit up, and the front of the house looks amazing sometimes, and you really don't need to do anything. But um, I think that um, I don't really try to go do 15 twilights in a twilight session. I try to keep it to like two to five. Um, and it just depends on the house because um, it's sometimes it's overkill to me, you know, like I'm not going to go shoot five angles of the backyard at twilight. If I could light one angle, that's the best angle and just kind of focus on that. Um, but, but everybody, it's all different, you know, that's just me. Can I ask you a quick what? question? So both um, Sam and Gary Castle, you guys both shot the Razor House. I'd love to know like one thing that you really got out of what you learned out of shooting that house that informed the rest of your photography. I didn't, I didn't use a ton of light in, uh, in that house. Like, um, I, you know, when, when you're in a house like that, the light is there already, you know, um, like I said, you can enhance certain things and that's kind of where I'd almost bring in a soft box and do kind of like directional lighting for, for like effect more than, uh, like practicality just because to make it more artsy, you know, lighting can be a big deal um, in how a photo comes out, especially if you're thinking about it beforehand. Um, but I was able to spend a lot more time in that place than Sam was. I got like 14 hours in there. So I had I had time to like, you know, play around and kind of look at things and wait for right timing and, and everything else. Like Sam had to just run through it and, do it fast you know even though you had to you had to go there a couple times though huh yeah i you know the first time i was there i had three hours to do twilight and uh aerial so i went back and had another two hours so five hours total in two sessions uh to answer your question tacy i think you know when you show up to a place like this this is a i don't know what it was, it was like a 10 to fifteen thousand square foot home it was it's uh, listed at $40 million. It was sold for 21.5, I think. But, it, you know, it's one of those homes that is just crazy. But it really humbles you when you show up, you put your lights away because it is so massive. Everything is concrete. You can't balance anything off of it. So it really uh, challenges you to be creative. And I love shoots like that because, you know, I always talk about how when you show up to a home and you get this panic attack, that's the right home for you to get better. So when I show up to this home, I had this minor panic attack. And then I'm like, okay, I can do this. And I put the flash away and I shot and covered my bases and got some really good composition. And in a way, it actually freed me up to focus on the composition and get the shot that I wanted. And uh, ultimately, you let Mother Nature, the natural light in the twilight, do the work for you. Because this is like the best, you know, one percentile uh, creme de la creme real estate in San Diego and the, the architect designed everything the way it should be so that you can take advantage of that. The way the light comes into the room, that's been thought over for hundreds of hours. You might as well take advantage of that. So you, you let the architecture itself sort of inform your shooting and you can be kind of rest assured that you're going to get the right shot if you get the composition right. The lighting will take care of itself if you do your sort of three to five exposure compensation. Uh, so your brackets to so that you have enough to work with when you get home. So it was, you know, it was one of those projects that comes around once in a while where that it challenges you, but also makes you better. And those are, you know, that's what I, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing is for projects like this. And I'm so glad that Gary shot it too, so we can sort of commiserate about it. <laughs> you, know, this whole Listen, you guys, I am fun. going to apologize right now because we got so many amazing questions. We really had to uh, filter and kind of use the upvotes to, uh, to decide what we were going to answer tonight. I have a feeling this is going to spawn off some really great posts, whether it's on PFRE or one of the boards, but we do have to switch over to the giveaways. So 
Brian, I think you are running the uh, the random number generator. Yeah, I'll take or care of that. Or is that coming out of Mr. Jordan no, Powers? I'll do the random number generator. Jordan has a list. Jordan, what are we at? 113? Yeah. Well, awesome. yep. So, so, so we have just 113 really, people. 113. Do, uh, well, we have more than that, no, but we obviously actually do, really, do ourselves. really quick. Rich, can you can you just verify the last name of the the last name as of right now who donated, since you seem to have the most up to date information. I'll try. Hold on a second. Um, the last person donations. Uh, Joanna Kaznecka. Oh, okay. Joanna! Thank you. I don't have that. So, so the last person I have is Ryan Botheridge. So yeah, I have Joanna from? is is. Okay. The, the next Jordan, Joanna is one of mine. So if you just put in Joanna and if she's the, you know, if she comes up, I'll hook you up with the information if you don't have it. Okay, okay. cool. Awesome. So guys, thank, thank you so you, much. We've, 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 we've raised up to very close to $6,000 at this point, right? Yeah, 5784. 5784. 5799. Yeah, 57. That is amazing. I am so so proud of everybody and uh what a great time thank you guys it's wonderful so i got my i got my random random generator ready to go are you want to do it rich you're good to go yeah well actually you guys okay, so, so just so just so people can see there's no collusion <laughs> i've got um i i have i have my i have everything pulled up on my screen if i can just share my screen i'll just do it all right here rich you you have to, let's get let's rich, get put, that I'm sorry, Rich, put your max number in at 114 because that's how many donors we have that are eligible. Okay. One, one, oh, that works. Yeah, Rich, just do that. Go. Okay. I've got, hold on a so second. Let me give some context for the people at home real fast. So what we're doing here, guys, is Jordan and Brian put together an Excel spreadsheet of all of our donors. We have 114 donors. We've been updated Rich, as people donated throughout yeah. the day. And Rich is using a random number generator through Google, I think, right, Rich? And he's going to hit a button. So basically, whatever that number is that comes back will be the winner of our first prize, which is the <laughs> run and gun workflow by Gary Castle. Okay, so we have 114 <laughs> people in the pile, and here we go. All right. Number eight. Eight. Who is number eight? Lucky number eight. Uh, Mag Magin Erdanik. M-A-G-I-N-U-R-D-A-N-I-C-K. All right, Maginer Danik, you get the run and gun workflow with Gary Castle. Congratulations. These guys will figure out how to get it to you after the show. And who is getting the Shooting Spaces entire webinar co collection? Rich, let's hit that button. Yeah. All right, number 26. So 26. who is number 26? Brian Berkowitz. Okay, reroll. <laughs> just, 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 re just kidding. Just, just kidding. It's, uh, it's Todd <laughs> Provancher. Todd Provancher, awesome. All right, now it's who like is me getting... winning the Cam Ranger at PFRE? Okay, right, <laughs> yeah. So who is getting the art of real estate cinematography by Jordan Powers and the other guy? Ready? I'm sorry, ahead, Nick. Rich. Jesus Christ, that's so rude. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already the most hated guy in this business. <laughs> Uh, okay, you guys, no joke. Okay, hold on. We're gonna, don't, Rich, keep it there. I'm going to share my screen really quick. This is, um, okay, honest, and I'm not, okay, Nick actually won. I'm not joking, but you guys have to see this. Hold Holy on, hold shit. On. Hold on. I, I, how, how do I share my desktop? He's not allowed. I'm gonna, I'm, we're going to. Oh. Well, he can use the help. This is, this is not a joke. Um, wow, that's so funny. Okay, draw it. That's crazy, it so I'll take it, Jordan. Roll again. Roll again. Yeah, re-roll. That is so funny. You ready? Yeah. Yep. Okay, here we go. All right. Who is, is number 38? 38. 38. Linda Coffer. Or is it Linda? Let's go with Linda Coffer. Brian and Jordan, it's you guys have the email address. It's either a yeah. it's either Linda or Linda Coffer. I think it's and that Linda. Was for, Which one? This is for yours, Jordan, right? Yeah. yeah. This is for the art of real estate cinematography by Jordan yeah. Powers and Nick S. Give me just a second. All okay. right. Uh, all right. Get everybody to give me a quick smile on the camera. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Green shared. 
What do we got next? All right. Next up is the art and science of great composition by Tony Colangelo. Excellent. Excellent. You ready? On All three. right. Hit that One, number. Two, we'll cue up some music. Oh, I can't see. One. One. Uh, George T S A K. George T S A K. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Now, who gets mastering real estate photography? By Gary, right? Gary Gomez. Yes, by Gary That's Gomez. Me. Okay, here goes. 86. Number 86. Nancy O'Brien. Oh, right. All right, Nancy O'Brien. She's not a current yeah. student, is she, Gary? I'm about to check. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to check on mine too, just because I'd be, I feel really bad. Okay, while you guys are checking on yours, let's roll for one of the two. Yeah, I can check, the, I can check Jordan's list while he's looking it up. So. Nancy awesome. already has my tutorial. <laughs> she okay, does? So okay, let's draw another one. Thanks, Nancy. Need a re roll. One, 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 one. John Reith. J O H N. J O H N R I E T H. Oh, I think we got a winner. All right. Okay. So that was for Mastering Real Estate Photography by Gary Gomez. He is not a student of yours or not somebody who's bought the tutorial already, right, Gary? Nope, just check. Okay. <laughs> All right, cool. So next up is the ProEDU one-year subscription, part one of two. Who is number 96? Uh, let's see here, 96, 96. Jeremy Jordan. All right, Jeremy Jordan, ProEDU, one-year subscription. All right, we've got one more ProEDU, one-year subscription to give away. And this is the last one, right, just to be clear? Yes, yes. sir. 77. Lucky 77. Seven. Marty Lang. Marty Lang, Lava Submarine. So guys, I just want to remind everybody who just won to reach out. However, Brian or Jordan, you guys did keep track of that, right? Yeah, we keep track yeah. of it. What I would say is, um, depending on what you want, either reach out to that uh, tutorial creator directly and uh, we can just verify with them that you are the winner or just email me, uh, brian at shootingspaces.net and I will um, arrange with whoever is responsible for getting you that tutorial to get it to you. So just uh, shoot me an email and we'll take care of it from you. Awesome. So guys, before we thank everybody, I want to take a second. I got something to say. Um, you know, right. It's crazy. Um, I've been sitting on it for like a minute. No, that's not true at all. Um, look, you know, we've all kind of entered into this crazy time, right? COVID is kicking the shit out of a lot of our businesses and you know you could see the various sort of counters and the way people are adapting and you know there's a lot of uh, a lot of cross talk on a lot of the blogs and a lot of the real estate groups and you know there's not a playbook for this there's not a short answer there's not a, a rule set that really applies to all people and everybody here has their various circumstances and situations um, unlike most other things we've all faced in terms of crises, this is something that affects everyone across the board, all right? Jordan Powers in Minnesota, Vince Calora in New York City, Rich Baum in Sacramento, right? Dee Zunker in Houston. Houston, right, Dee? Okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, you know, and, and that extends to other countries too. So, you know, some of, the, some of the stories I was hearing, right, when Sam had said he got the call from his agent just checking in, right? Um, it really reminds me of something that I've been saying to my team and the people I deal with on a daily basis, which is we're all in this together. And now is the time when community is even more important. So in a lot of ways, some of us are competitors, right? We're, we're in the same business fighting for, you know, our slice of the pie. But just remember that we're all fighting the same sort of problem and we're all sharing and adapting our ways. So, you know, when you're heated and when you're getting into that discussion or whatever it is, just remember guys, we're all in this together. And tonight, 
this little group of people and this awesome audience raised almost $6,000 that's going to go to really good use and help a whole lot of people out. I am so thankful to Brian Berkowitz, Gary Castle, Tony Colangelo, Tacey Jungman, Sam Chen, Gary Gomez, Matt Stallone, Jordan Powers, Brandon Cooper, Rich Baum, D. Zunker, and Wayne Capilli for entertaining and educating everybody tonight. And I'm super, super, super thankful to everybody I see here in the audience, especially you guys who made it till this last couple of minutes, because it's two hours. That's more than most movies. You guys are awesome. Please don't stop being you. Don't stop sharing. Remember, we're all in this together. And, you know, the last thing I'm going to say tonight is, Alexa, play Smash Bath by All Star. <laughs> Let me see. Alexa, turn off studio lights. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Doesn't work. Thank you, Thank Vince. you, Vince. Thank well, you, Vince. Thank you, Vince, for moderating Thank this. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe, everybody.